Live from San Juan, Puerto Rico, it's theCUBE. Covering Blockchain Unbound. Brought to you by Blockchain Industries. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage in Puerto Rico for Blockchain Unbound, it's an event, global event, people from all around the world from South Africa, Miami, Russia, San Francisco, New York, all around the world talking about blockchain, cryptocurrency, the decentralized internet, and the future of money. That's the killer app in blockchain and cryptocurrency. I'm John Furrier, your host. Next guest is Scott Pickett, who's the founder and CEO of Melth, Wealth Migrate platform. Scott, thanks for coming on. Yeah, awesome, John, thanks for having me. It's quite an exciting group of people here. We met last night, we had a great conversation. I really liked uh, some of the things that we were talking about. I wanted to bring you on because um, being in South Africa where you're you know, living and working, you have a unique perspective because you see the global landscape. So, I'm from Silicon Valley, we're here in Puerto Rico. America's got their view. The UK just announced a deal with Coinbase yep. for essentially uh, a license to convert funds into separate bank accounts through faster payment mechanisms, basically taking crypto, turning it into fiat. Kind of a game changer. Yeah, look, I mean, the one thing with the UK is that they've been at the head of all the different innovation in the last five to 10 years. They were, the, they were right at the head in terms of crowdfunding, and they're doing exactly the same in terms of now with the, the whole crypto space. And it's actually quite interesting, because when you take into account Brexit, they actually really need to do it because they want funds coming into the country, they want to be seen as the future of the, you know, the, the banking market, et cetera. And so it's actually really exciting. And I mean, when you, when you look at around the world, it's fascinating that, and I said this to you last night, that you know, America really grew because Europe used to have all the controls. And so the capital basically left Europe and it went to America. And now what's happening 300 years later is America has all the controls and the capital's starting to go elsewhere. So America is turning into Europe. And so potentially it's a break, and I, would, I, I said that, you don't have to say it, I'm an American, and I, we're concerned about it. Americans are concerned that we don't want to be that old guard, like Europe was to America yep. in the America days. So a new liberation's happening. UK is putting a stake in the ground saying, we want to get our mojo back. Well, I mean, we're sitting here in Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting here <laughs> yeah, in Puerto Rico. Like... They're going to put a stake in the ground saying, we're going to give you tax breaks till 2036. This is a money flow game right now. So you've been doing some pioneering work. What's your perspective? Talk a little about some of the world dynamics that you see because let's face it, this is the transfer of money with crypto. It's happening at a massive scale, not just some you know, underbelly, boutique, underground activities. This is front and center, mainstream, real yeah. money, real commerce. Your thoughts? Well, I would, I'll take it a step back actually. I think there's eight major macro trends that are all culminating at the same time. So the first one is in the education space, and the whole of education is changing, and it's really becoming gamification, and it's becoming learning while doing. So you don't learn and then go and do something, you actually learn while you're doing it. The second one for me is the whole blockchain, and what that's enabling people is getting democratization to wealth and, and access to assets, whether they're in their country or global assets, basically. The third thing that's really important is you've got the rise of the middle class, and a lot of people talk about the unbanked three billion, but what they don't realize is there's 1.2 billion people joining the middle class. And they are primarily in the emerging world. They're in Africa, India, you know, China. And what they want is they want health, they want education, and they want access to wealth. You know, then you take into account what's happening in terms of uh, collaborative investing. And in the old days it was, I do it on my own, you do it on your own, we sort of trust the financial industry. Now we're coming together, it's the power of the crowd. And you know, I could go on and on, that's just four of them. There's another four. They're all coming together, and because of this is happening, is why we're seeing this, this metamorphosis. And cryptocurrencies is the catalyst you know, on top of blockchain that's allowing this to take place. Talk about some of the things that you've been advocating for. I know we were, you were sharing a private story, maybe this may or may not be the right time to talk about it, but you put forth some pretty um, forthright concepts um, in, in, in memos and letters to folks, uh, and no one will publish it. What are, what are those views? Because we've got the cameras rolling right now. Um, share your vision. Well, I mean, so, so again, you know, I, I fundamentally believe that technology can solve grand, solve grand challenges. And when you take the, our platform and what we're doing, we're effectively helping the 99% invest in commercial real estate like the top 1%. So what we were talking about last night was, I come from a country, South Africa, I was previously from Zimbabwe, and unfortunately for us is that in South Africa, they're talking now about taking away land without compensation. So land redistribution without compensation. Now, Einstein says that if you want to solve a problem, 
you can't solve it with the same reality that created the problem. And so I wrote a letter to the president, an open letter two weeks ago, and I said, listen, why don't we do it differently? You know, giving a person a piece of land in the middle of nowhere when they've never been a farmer will not help them get wealthy, I guarantee it. And if I'm wrong, let's go look at Zimbabwe, which is an economic disaster. What about if we give them access to ownership of a good quality commercial asset that's earning a passive income? That is how you will, you will grow your wealth. And then add to that, you know, Cape Town you know, nearly became the first city, and it still could be the first city, that literally runs out of water. So why don't you go and build a desalinization plant in Cape Town with government money, allow people that you would give land to actually access to that asset and allow them to have the ownership. And you know, that, that's sort of the concept where you just think about it completely different. Yeah. And you, you allow technology to actually get people what they want, which is wealth and prosperity for their family, and not just a farm in the middle of nowhere. And you're really addressing, I think, the incentive system combined with structural change. You talked about gamification earlier. This is kind of the dynamic. How important from an education standpoint, meaning educating stakeholders, old guard or existing governments, because you have this organic groundswell coming up of young people, um, people with vision that are older and more experienced like us. What's the, what's the formula? How do you get this ball rolling? So it's quite interesting, you know, I get asked this question all the time and you know, for us, in the first world, a lot of what we're talking about is a nice to have. It's, it's sort of a bit of a game and if I can participate. But where I come from in the emerging world, it's a necessity. Yeah. There, there are no other solutions. Yeah. So if you live in South Africa or China or India and you want to get your money into a first world country like England, Australia or America, it's, it's very, very difficult and, and virtually no one can do it. But it's a major problem because you want wealth preservation, you want a plan B, you want your children to be able to go to a first world university, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And so to answer your question, I think the way it'll get solved is in communities where it's not a nice to have, it's a necessity. In terms of you know, educating the old God, I believe that what happens is you, you get groundswell. Like literally when people really need a solution solved, they persuade governments and regulators to change. And it's interesting, coming back to how we started the conversation, that's why smaller countries are often the ones to adopt the regulatory change and more importantly, countries in emerging markets. Whereas first world countries are trying to protect what they have. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, the new world is, is about capital and it's capital flows. It's, it's a choice between playing offense or defense, really in my mind, use a sports metaphor, whatever sports you like. Um, you know, we love the, the sports analogies, but this is what UK is doing, they're playing offense. And I think you're seeing other uh, countries wanting to restructure themselves as digital nations because that's what the young people are expecting. So with that in mind, you have a global fabric here. This event is just a microcosm of what we're seeing, which is outside the US, call their little US bubble that we're living in, Silicon Valley, that's one case, some area. But the growth outside the United States and even in, in Asia and then you know, south of the border, if you will, south of the equator, there's a ton of global action. What is, in your opinion, the global, the number, the few global things that are going on that people should know about when it comes to how money's flowing and the, what they could do to take advantage of the trend rather than trying to hold it back? What do, you, what do we do? Is it get into the, the current, ride the wave? What should people understand about the new global dynamic? So the first thing I would say is, you know, I, I always laugh at this, but people don't understand how much innovation's going on in China. So like go and understand WeChat to start off with. Like it is phenomenal what is happening. The second thing for me is the global capital flows. You know, when you consider how much capital is moving from the emerging world into the first world, primarily in real estate at the moment, and that's just the top 1% of the top 1%. You know, that's the people with 10, 100 million dollars. But I've already said to you, there's 1.2 billion people coming into the emerging markets in, in the middle class. They're going to want the same things. And so those yeah. capital flows are going to be going cross-border. I also believe with time, capital flows will be going from the first world into the emerging world in a safe way, but wanting higher returns. So the, 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 the emerging world, the US has a shrinking middle class, but yet the emerging world has a growing middle class. Big time. That's going to attract new entrants. Exactly. Okay. Well, I mean, take, take into account China. Has China had a big impact on the global economy in the last 20 years? Yes, yes or no? Yes. How many people are in the middle class in China? Plus minus? Don't know. Okay, so it, it's, I've heard different reports from 200 million to 400 million. Okay, so, but, but that's, whether it's, it's 200 it's, it's or 400. It's more than it was 10 years ago. I know, but think about <laughs> the impact that's had on the global economy. I'm now saying that this is 1.2 billion in the next 10 years. It's either a factor of five to eight, depending on which way you want to look at it. How much money in your guesstimation, if you had to throw a dart at the board, order of magnitude, is flowing out of China with crypto into other uh, assets? 
Sure, in, in the crypto space, that's fascinating, you know, because a lot of it is hard to tell, actually. I mean, I mean in, in real estate last year alone, it was just short of $30 billion went into commercial real estate from China. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of that money is, is sort of gray, like no one actually knows where it's coming from, which is why China tightened it up so much. It's also why they tightened up the crypto side of things, because a lot of people want to get their money out of the country. And, and into first world into first world economies, and that's why in the emerging world, cryptocurrencies have been embraced more actually than in the first world. It's a faster way to move that Coming money. Coming back to necessity. Yeah. So, like in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in China, you pay more for a Bitcoin than you do in America or Europe. I don't know if you know that. No, I don't know that. And, and by quite a lot. Like in Zimbabwe, you pay nearly double. So we, a lot of people are making money by arbitraging coins. They buy them in Europe, they sell them in South Africa, they sell them in Zimbabwe, yeah. they sell them in Nigeria. So the demand to move the money out of country is exactly. very high. Well, because they've got, they've got uh, capital controls. So they've got currency controls. So you're only allowed to move a certain amount of capital out of the country legally. So what happens now, you buy cryptocurrency and you, you can effectively invest in assets around the world. And you, know, I, you, you, you literally started off this conversation right in the beginning. There, there's a democratization in terms of capital flows and what's happening. And people are going to put their capital where they want it. And, and governments, I believe, are not going to be able to control it by putting up controls. They're going to have to make their countries attractive so that the capital is flowing into the country, not out yeah, of the country. Yeah. So what's your take on big multinational corporations that have capital structures, have equity positions, and it could be also growing venture-backed or private equity-based companies. They have capital uh, structures, they have equity investors, in some cases public and privates, and unicorn values or whatnot. Now moving to look at utility tokens as a way to get to a global gamification. So you have multiple securities, a utility, and a, in some cases, security token and or real security. That seems to be a dynamic. Are you seeing that on a global scale? Are you seeing any activity there? We're seeing a little bit of movement around big companies trying to figure out how to play in crypto. Look, from my experience, not a huge amount. I think yeah. that most people, you know, they have a board, it's all around reputation. They go meet the lawyers. The lawyers tell them you're going to yeah. get crucified. And so from my experience, not a huge amount. It, it tends to be the small to medium enterprises that are prepared to go yeah. out and look at it. However, I will say from, from our personal business perspective, we've built our entire company on a community. Like we've got shareholders all over the world. And so for me, when it came to the crypto and the ICO market, that was just doing that you know, more aggressively, yeah. effectively. And community-based companies are the future. So whether you're a Fortune 500 company or a startup, it's all about building the community. And I believe that whether it's utility token or security or yeah. a combination of the two, it provides an incredible vehicle to, to ultimately be the catalyst to your community. And if you're the catalyst to your community adding value, then you're going to build a company of value. Yeah, and capture that value. Um, so, Scott, I got to ask you um, about Wealth Migrate. Talk about your platform. First of all, thank you for sharing your perspective here on the oh, Cube. Sure, it's been fantastic to get that data out. What's your company about? Take a minute to explain what you guys are doing, your value proposition, state of the company. Are you doing an ICO? Have you had an ICO? What's the status of the company? So from Wealth Migrate's perspective, the platform went live in October 2013, so we, we're a little over uh, four years in now. We've effectively got members from 111 countries around the world, and we've raised just short of $70 million all through the platform, all on blockchain. We facilitated real estate deals of over $485 million. And what I'm proudest of, actually, is that we've got a higher than 70% reinvestment rate. So what we're doing is we're allowing the 99% to invest like the 1%. Our minimum investment at the moment is $1,000. We beta testing $100, and my dream is to get it to $1. Now, you asked a little bit about the ICO. We built our, block, you know, our platform on blockchain not because of an ICO. Our number one challenge was trust. And ultimately, blockchain enabled us to solve the trust problem. The second thing for us is that my dream is to get it to a dollar per person per investment. I want to solve the wealth gap. And I truly believe we can do it when we can allow anyone, anywhere, to invest in good quality assets. I can't do it with the current system. There's too many friction costs. Yeah, and there's with, a lot of hurdles, and block and whether it's semantics, education, and or hurdle rate on dollars. But it's an interesting concept. You want to make the 99% invest like the 1%. Explain what that means. Take a, take a minute to explain that concept. And some people go like, okay, I know what the 1% is. It was a, it was a, you know, a movement about that. So like, now you're talking about something pretty radical and interesting. What does that actually mean? I mean, I'm, so let, let, making, let, empowering people to make more money? I mean, unpack that concept. So let, let me ask you a question. Do you personally own a medical building? Do I own what? A medical building. No. Like a hospital medical building. No. So it's 19, uh, 2009, I'm in Bondi Beach, Sydney, and I meet two US dollar billionaires. I'd, I'd helped about 2,500 people buy houses and apartments in England, Australia, America, and South Africa. 
And I sat with them and I said, what are you investing in? They said, medical buildings. I said, why medical buildings? And they said, well, think about it. No matter what happens in the global economy, people need doctors. I was like, that makes sense. Secondly, they said, doctors never move. I was like, that makes sense. Thirdly, doctors are very good at being doctors, but they're not accountants. And so they sign long-term, good, favorable leases. Now, from a property perspective, real estate perspective, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. And I said to them, how do I participate? And they said, it's really simple. It's for friends and family. There's eight people only. It's five million Australian dollars each. I was like, ah, oh, now there's the problem. That company today is over $700 million. It's on the Australian Stock Exchange, and it's what I call financial exclusion. You and me don't own medical buildings. Since October 2013, we've enabled people to invest in medical buildings from $1,000. So the top 1% get wealthy by investing in better assets than the 99%. Because they have access. Because they've got access. And the cash. And the cash. But we've dropped the barriers to entry. Because you and I can participate now from $1,000, and I will get it to $1. So it's a combination of leveraging the asset-based uh, securitization with that, with that opportunity by using a crowdsourcing kind of model? Is that what Correct. you're thinking? So, so effectively, and I'd, I'd suggest- I'm oversimplifying it, but like- No, no, 100%. I'd suggest everyone goes and looks up the term collaborative investing which is ultimately, it's a, it's a thing that's been going on for decades by very wealthy people on how to successfully invest. We've taken that and we've added a smart component. And why that's important is because in the past you needed 10, $50 million to do collaborative investing. Now you can do collaborative investing with $1,000. Yeah, and what's beautiful is that you understand potentially what, whose reputation you're working with, you can roll, move, move in herds, network effect kicks in. That's awesome. No, dude, it's, it's, it's what, what, what gives me the greatest pleasure. I mean, yeah. children, my, my son is six years old. He's already investing. You know, <laughs> most kids are playing Monopoly. He's playing real Monopoly, okay? Yeah. And, and so are adults. And what gives me the most pleasure and pride ever, and what I'm grateful for, is that we're changing people's lives. You know, people talk about how to uh, solve the welfare system, all kinds of things. You, give, you make people own something, or try to own something, or trade, whether they make money or lose money, you learn from it, you're better for it. Here, you're providing a great service by opening the door, lowering the barriers to entry to potentially wealth creation. Dude, I call it, I call it freedom. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if you, where you want to live, where you want to send your kids to school, or how you want to retire, whether you want to yeah. donate to the church or whatever, I don't really care what you want, but I want you to have the freedom to be able to yeah. do it. And wealthy people get that freedom by investing in quality assets. Yeah. And we're just allowing them to do that now. And the democratization is, is multifold. In this case, you're creating a new economy model. So the whole, to freedom, democracy aspect is in play. Well, I mean, if you think about it, when you get it to a dollar per person, okay, one dollar will not change your life. But if you change your habits, you'll change your financial destiny. Yeah. And so my philosophy is get it to a dollar so that every single person can participate. And once yeah. you start to learn good habits around money and wealth, the rest just, it's, it's, a, it's it, a formula. like It's a flywheel, kicks exactly. in. Scott Pickens, who's the Pickens, who's founder and CEO of Wealth Migrate Platform, from South Africa, formerly of Zimbabwe, we learned today. Uh, great sharing the global perspective. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Exclusive coverage from Puerto Rico. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, getting the signal here out of all the noise in the market. This is what we do, this is theCUBE's mission to bring you the best content, best story from the best people. More coverage here in Puerto Rico, day one of two days of coverage after this short break. Thanks for watching.